Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath to those online. I hope the sound maintains well and clear and that you're able to follow with us. I would invite us to pray as we begin our message today entitled, Writing the Wrongs of the Past. That is the title for our message uh, today. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, at this time as we spend some time in the Bible, looking at, dear Lord, a particular passage that is highly relevant for us as cardinal, as individuals. Lord, we pray for your spirit to be amidst us. Please guide us. Please help us to follow closely this message. We pray, dear Father, that at the end of it, you may impress on us as individuals that which you want us to do. We ask, dear Lord, for this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, for those of you who watch Channel 4 News, you will have seen the reports of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and some of what took place in the 1960s. Some of us don't get the chance to watch the news often, so we missed it, but we were able to see um, things that were being circulated in WhatsApp groups and so forth. And it was very sad and heavy to read and to hear what took place. Terrible things, we would say. And what was clear was there was a need for the church to respond. And later on, I saw the president of the South England Conference bring a heartfelt apology that he expressed to the victims who suffered in the 60s and also to the failures that perhaps the church will have been associated with. And it was an effort to clearly right the wrongs of the past. Many who are maybe here in administration today might not have been the same people, but it was felt fitting that there was a need to right the wrongs of the past. Many of us, perhaps we too have things that have happened in the past, that have happened now, that will be presented with an opportunity to rectify. And today I would like us to cast our minds or to turn in our Bibles to the book of Numbers, chapter 21. Here we'll find a story describing Israel's journey, Israel's history, let me say, where they too did some terrible things. And we, we will follow closely the story of then what happens and the opportunity they had to write the wrongs of the past. I'm going to read here from the New King James Version, and it's Numbers chapter 21. I'll read three verses, one to three. The king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Atharim. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of that place was called Homer. Let's pause there for now. If you notice the beginning, verse 1 starts by describing the Canaanites or the king of Arad uh, who was a Canaanite. The Canaanites are familiar to us. If you've studied the Old Testament, you read about how they were described as giants. They, were, they had a strong army. They were feared by the uh, surrounding um, places that were nearby. They knew the Canaanites to be a mighty people. And we read how 
it describes here that Israel had an encounter with the Canaanites. And Israel is described in verse 2 as having made a vow or a pledge to God. And they say to God, if you will deliver us or deliver these people, the Canaanites, into our hands, then we will utterly destroy their cities. Now, in order for us to fully understand this, we have to now go back into history to find where we see phrases like utterly destroy them, especially in relation to the Canaanites. And I found a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 20 that we need to refer to from verse 16 to 18. And just keep in mind as I read this reference to utterly destroy and to also the Canaanites. So Deuteronomy chapter 20 from verse 16 to 18. And this is God speaking to Israel. And he says, but of the cities of these people which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive, but you shall utterly destroy them. The Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, and the Perizzite, and the Hevite, and the Jebusite. But as the Lord your God has commanded you, and then the reason is given, verse 18, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations which they have done for their gods and you sin against the Lord your God. So if you follow closely here, God had already said to Israel, he's promised them a land that they were to occupy. And this land was to be Can um, uh, the land of Canaan. And there he says you will meet people who already live there and these people have got practices that they have. And if you go into history you'll realize that the Canaanite had all sorts of gods that they worshipped. And one of the commandments is thou shalt have no other gods before me. So clearly God was saying when you get to this place there will be things that go against what God wants us as people to do. He doesn't want us having multiple gods or relations and elevating other gods above him. And so he said to them, if you get there, then you should utterly destroy what is around you. Otherwise, the influence is going to take over. And did they do that? If we go into history, we find that they had failures. Israel failed to do what God had said. And what happened? They started to struggle and some of the things exactly God had described started to happen. Verse 18 said, if you don't destroy them, then um, lest they teach you according to their abominations, uh, which they have done for their gods, and you will sin against the Lord. Now, if I come back to our passage in, uh, in Numbers 21. We were on verse 2, and we were trying to understand why Israel was now making this vow to the Lord to say, if God is with them and God delivers these people, then they will de utterly destroy them. Now, in order for us to then get the full picture Israel was in this case actually making a pledge to rectify the things of the past or to right the wrongs that they had done before. Why do we say this? We find the account earlier on in Numbers where Israel did some very terrible things, let me say. In Numbers chapter 13, if you have a Bible, please go there with me. We will come across an earlier account in history where God had already promised them a land. And we find in verse 13, I'm going to read it from verse 1 to 3. Numbers 13 from verse 1 to 3. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. For each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone a leader among you. 
So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran according to the command of the Lord, all the men who were heads of the children of Israel. Let me pause there. The story hopefully is familiar to many. If not, then the brief summary is this. Israel's history, they found themselves as slaves at one point. They were slaves in Egypt. They were working under Pharaoh's rulership and they were being forced to do things that were not pleasant. And God promised them that they'll be delivered from slavery. He said, I'm going to give you your own place where you don't have to work for these Egyptians anymore. You will have a land called Canaan that you will occupy. And God does these miraculous things that we know about where he parts this big Red Sea and they're able to escape uh, the following armies of Pharaoh. And then they journey all the way towards Canaan. And just as they are about to reach the land, this is now where we are in verse uh, 1 of chapter 13, where the Lord speaks to Moses and he says, Now send out some spies into Canaan. And their job for the spies, they were to scout out the land, see what it's like, um, and, and bring a report back. And so there was a representative from every tribe that is sent out. Those spies go out, and when they come back, this is what they have to say. Verse 26 of Numbers 13. Now they departed, the spies that is, they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey and this is the fruit nevertheless the people who dwell in the land are strong the cities are fortified and very large moreover we saw the descendants of anak there the amalekites dwell in the land of the south the hittites the jebusites the amorites dwell in the mountains and the canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the jordan verse 30 then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him, who were not able to go up against the people, for, let me read that again, verse 31. But the men who had gone with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and saw we were in their sight. So this is the bit of background that we needed to follow in order to fully follow closely the wrongs that Israel did. Verse 1 started by clearly saying, the Lord had promised to give Canaan to Israel. They were told by God, this is the land that I will give you. The spies go out and they say, oh, the land is beautiful. They brought grapes. The Bible describes how it needed two men to carry the size of the grapes that they saw in this land. So clearly it was flowing with milk and honey, the words described by, um, by the Bible. It was a beautiful place that God wanted to give them. But, but the report that came back was, oh, no. We can't take this land. They have some giants. They have big, strong men. Ah, oh, this land devours its inhabitants. I'm just simply quoting the words in the Bible. So the spies who went out came back in essence with a message that doubted God's abilities. They're saying, oh no, we can never do this because the people we saw, they are too mighty than, than us. God had said one thing, the men who came back said the very opposite. Let's not go because we can't do it. 
What they were trying to do in essence is to go in their own strength. And they're saying as human beings, we can't do this because these mine are mightier than us. They will just fight over us. But this is not what God had said. God had not said, go and fight and take over. God had simply said, go and I will give you the land. How he was going to do it was up to God. You know, there's many a time when we are faced with situations where perhaps we can feel the impression of what God wants us to do. But it feels unnatural and we sense we are not capable of going through. And the tendency sometimes is just to realize the obstacles and why we can't do it. Rather than to prayerfully say, if this is what God wants me to do and I'm feeling this impression, then somehow the Lord will do it. God had said this land is theirs and they simply needed to obey. And somehow God would do it for them. But the wrong that Israel did was to say, ooh, we will, we will struggle. We can't do it. We, they wanted to fight. And so it goes even worse on verse four, chapter 14 of Numbers. Listen now to how they go from bad to worse. Numbers 14. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. You know, when I read this, I just, a little shiver comes upon because you follow the story and you realize God had good intentions. He wanted to bless these people who had been treated as slaves in Egypt. And he says, I'm going to free you. I'm going to give you your own land that is so blessed and fruitful. And you can have all the fruits you like. And this is yours. I will give it to you. The spies come back and they said, oh, no, no, there's giants there. We can't do it. They try to do it in their own strength. And now it says they are crying and weeping and wishing they were back in Egypt as slaves. They're complaining, it says, against Moses. Why did you lead us this way so that our wives and children are just going to die in this place as victims? They completely forgot everything that God had been doing along the way, parting the Red Sea for them, giving them manna, putting this cloud over their heads, God doing the impossible uh, for them. And this same God wanted to provide this place of safety for them. And Israel, great sin, is portrayed by the Bible in history as being one that really stucks out. And they're really almost mocking God to say, why did you do this to us, God? Why did you bring us here just to die? And it says on verse 4, they're actually wanting to now select their own leader to take them back to Egypt. When God had given them a leader to take them into the promised land. You know, you can imagine if you were God, after all that you've done for your children, and this is the response that you get back. A lot of us are parents, and sometimes, yes, things happen, and it touches you, and it pains you. And this, we hear another account where God is looking down on his people, and they're crying, saying, Lord, why did you do this to us? We just want to go back to slavery. We want to go back to Pharaoh. And this is how God felt. The Bible describes in Numbers chapter 14 from verse 11. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me? With all the signs which I have performed among them, I will strike them with a pestilence, and disinherit them and I will make you a nation greater than they you can sense how God felt about the responses of Israel 
to say after all the wonders that God has done and now they dare say we wish we were just back in Egypt why God did you bring this to us they completely missed the point to say God wanted to give them this land it was not uh, for them to define it or to say we're gonna fight in our own way but to simply trust that God would do it for us and so God says you know what I've had enough he says to Moses I'm gonna strike these people and I'm gonna make a new nation uh, built on you Moses and Moses is listening to what God is saying and he realizes the gravity of what is before him and Moses being the leader he was starts to plead with God and say no Lord uh, help and, and, and have mercy upon them and the story continues in Numbers 14 verse 39 this time and it says then Moses told the words of all the ch let me start again then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel and the people mourned greatly so what was Moses telling people he was telling what God had now told Moses that he's gonna destroy all of them and he's going to replace them with another um, nation and it says on verse 40 they rose early in the uh, let me let me read this again closely and they rose early in the morning and wept up to the top of the mountain saying here we are and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised for we have sinned and Moses said now why do you transgress the command of the Lord for this will not succeed do not go up lest you be defeated by your enemies for the Lord is not among you for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you and you shall fall by the sword because you have turned away from the Lord the Lord will not be with you but they presumed to go up to the mountain top nevertheless the ark of the covenant of the Lord no Moses departed from the camp and verse 35 45 then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Homer now if you follow this closely it starts with some bad becomes more bad and becomes terrible bad because now Israel having realized the bad things they had done by saying to the Lord oh we wish we were back in Egypt why did you bring us this far and they 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 just doubted God and put a cast uh, of doubt over everything that God planned for them when God says to Moses this is what I will do to Israel they realize their sin but now instead of finding a way that would bring them back in line with God they now say we're gonna go now and fight the Canaanites now we're ready remember last time they were told to go into Canaan and they said we won't go there the spies say oh the, the giants there we're not going oh we want to go back to Egypt now Israel is saying oh we should have gone so now now we're gonna go we're gonna go and fight them we're gonna do what we should have done but this is the other grave mistake the wrong that Israel did Moses says it clearly on verse 41 God is not with you don't go there now in your own strength God has not asked you to go and fight you haven't asked for the blessings of the Lord and do they heed Moses do they listen to him no Israel is determined to go in their own strength they are want to fight for this land now they want to do it in their own power and they say we're gonna go to these Canaanites yes they're giants but we're prepared we're gonna march and take over you know the lesson that keeps coming up time after time in this account is that we in our human nature if we want to go in our own strength the end result is almost certain we fail because we're human we make terrible mistakes because we're human we do things that are not right because we are human and the moment we go without God this is the outcome verse 45 describes how the Canaanites attack them 
and they drove them back drove them back as far as Homa. they were defeated basically and notice now the key phrase as we get towards the heart of what I was impressed to share with you all by God today where were they driven back to Homa is where the Israelites were driven back to let's go back to where we started in our main scripture reading numbers chapter 21 verse 3 and the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them in their cities so the name of the place was called Homer this is where the bad tends beautiful where we realize that God brought his people back to the place of defeat so that he could give them victory the same place where in the past when Israel tried to go and fight the Canaanites in their own strength they were driven back as far as Homer by the Canaanites and they suffered heavy defeat because they were going to they were going in their own strength trying to fight in their own strength but numbers 21 is a beautiful ending because now Israel recognizes the wrongs of the past and Numbers 21 starts with now the Canaanites being described in verse 1. They're still mighty and giant and uh, strong. But then verse 2 now describes how Israel is making this vow and this pledge to the Lord. And I'm going to read it again because now it's going to make more sense because we've read the history. It says, so Israel, let me start from verse 1 once again. Then the king of Arad, the Canaanite who dwelt in the south, in the south heard that Israel was coming on the road then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners verse 2 so Israel made a vow to the Lord and said if you will deliver this people into my hand then I will utterly destroy their cities so Israel when they are brought back to the same place of Homer this time they make the vow to the Lord they plead with the Lord and say Lord if you will deliver these people into our hands then we will utterly destroy their cities it's connecting all the dots that we had been following all the time when initially God had said to them I will give you this land when you get to this land destroy them otherwise they will spoil you with their practices and their gods they did not do it they even uh, wanted to go back to Egypt and now they realize the wrongs of the past they said we've tried in the past to do it in our own strength and we were led to homer and suffered defeat now we are back in this place called homer we will plead with the lord and say lord if you will give these people into our hands we will do what we should have done in the first place we will go in your own we will be led by god this time round praise the Lord for this outcome because now the Lord listened to the voice of Israel verse 3 and he delivered the Canaanites into their hands and Israel was able to gain victory you know there are things that as we look back we realize that we perhaps fit in the place of Israel we have some wrongs things that we've done wrong and we've completely left God's path we've gone against God's will and God's intention and the end result always bad horrible uncomfortable but Israel recognized that should they come back to the Lord he will give them defeat and God brings them back to the place of defeat in order to now give them victory in order to right the wrongs of the past and as I look around and I think of where Cardinal is, I realize we have many wrongs we've done. Just like Israel, we've drifted and wandered and done some things in our own strength that we should never have. We suffer defeat and we're still suffering defeat. Perhaps because we have drifted and just like Israel did, trying to do things in our own strength doubting what God has promised that he will do Israel was bold enough or rather not even bold enough humble enough 
to bring themselves to pleading with God and saying again, now if you do this for us, please Lord, grant us the opportunity to right the wrongs of the past. And God brought them back to this place of Homer. Now when I hear Homer, I, I think of beautiful things because it's such a positive ending because now the place that was associated with defeat is associated with victory because they come back now with God leading them and they're able to do the right thing. I believe firmly that God wants to bring Cardinal back to Homer to rectify the wrongs of the past and give us victory once again and see his people live in that land of promise that God wanted us to be, our Canaan. Yes, we've lost it along the way. Yes, we've done some wrong things. But just like he did it for Israel, he brought them back to that same place of defeat and he brought them victory. I believe firmly that he does want to do that for us. It's up to us whether we take the same path that Israel took, where they then made this vow with the Lord and pleaded with God to say, if you will do it for us, then we will simply follow according to your leading. God is calling for those who sense that he is able to do all things, that he has promised in his word that if we ask, he is faithful. If we ask, the Bible says in Matthew 7 verse 7, knock and the door will be open. Seek and you will find. I believe strongly that if we do just that and say, Lord, we see the wrongs of the past and we don't want to be associated with the wrongs of the past any further we want to come and say lord bring us back to this place called homer and grant us defeat then he will do it he has promised he will and it just takes men and women who are humble enough to say lord please do it take away this tendency for me to follow the inklings of humanity and to seek to want to do things in my own way to see the blockers to see the giants of canaan to see how it's impossible to repair these broken relationships god says he can do all things and so we are called upon to prayerfully present our requests before him and let him be god let him do what he's able to do. And as I close tonight, I appeal to you as an individual to say you've had this message of Israel, the wrong things they did, the mistakes they made along the journey. And I raise my hand, I'm part of those who've made mistakes along the journey. But my impression, strong impression and strong Holy Spirit impression is that I can now be a part of pleading and saying Lord bring us back to this place of victory transform me help me to right the wrongs of the past help me give me another opportunity let's say present me back to this place of defeat called home and help me find the right words I don't know what it is that you feel impressed by the Holy Spirit that perhaps there are things not looking at somebody else but just looking at you as an individual you will know the things that perhaps you sense you could have done differently and God says it's okay we have a history of failures in God's people there's nothing new there's many of God's children who have made terrible things and we read about them just like we did now but just like we read about terrible things, we read about lovely things of a God who restores and a God who is able to right the wrongs of the past if we ask him. And we too can close by just simply saying, Lord, help us as individuals, not looking to somebody else, as me, as Reed, the things I've done wrong, help me to right them. Not in my strength, but in God's strength. Let us pray. Father in heaven, there are many of us who have followed this message and feel, Lord, the impression 
that Lord we can be a part of the good news of righting the wrongs of the past Lord I pray for those of us who have this urge this strong impression that Lord you can do it Lord please grant us the victory Lord there are those who have heard the appeal they're online they're listening they're in St. Oswald's they're listening and we recognize dear Lord that yes just like Israel we've done some wrongs but Lord you want to bring us back to Homer you want to give us victory at the same place we suffered defeat Lord you will present individuals before us who we wronged and you will give us an opportunity to right our wrongs with these individuals Lord I pray that when these opportunities come to us may we not see the giants of Canaan before us may we not see the stumbling blocks and why we can't go forward but may we see the God who's able to do and provide that which he has promised I pray dear father that you will enable us to right the wrongs of our past I pray that Lord you will give us victory and Lord lead us forward not father remembering the defeat but this time just being so grateful for the victory that you have given us and Lord as I pray uh, I close in prayer I firmly believe that Lord you can do for this congregation many good things going ahead we've taken many bruises we've taken many many disappointing and tears have gone down and still go down but Lord I firmly believe you're able to do it for us going forward and I pray that just like Moses interceded for his people that Lord you would listen and haken and and and, and provide dear Lord mercy and pardon I pray dear Lord that you will grant us victory and we can say oh yes there were so many wrongs done but now we don't look back at wrongs we see the victory that the Lord has given us in his strength we're able to proceed I pray that for those who want to walk this journey and who are listening and praying along please grant us your blessing we cannot do it in our own strength but Lord with God all things are possible amen